Welcome to Midlife Matters, where we celebrate women's wisdom and wit. I'm Georgianne Lucier, your host, and I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, Gloria Horbati, who is a Wallingford resident, and she teaches and designs Ukrainian eggs. And we're here to learn about that and about her fascinating life um, over the years and the many organizations that she's with. So welcome, Gloria. Nice to meet you. And you developed this art form at age six and developed it into a passion and really a career. <laughs> and tell us a little bit about the art of these Ukrainian eggs. Well, the Ukrainian Easter eggs are the oldest um, art form that I know that Ukrainians have. They found them through archaeological excavations in Ukraine um, during the time of the building of the pyramids. Um, they were, it was the Neolithic period, and the first eggs that they found were the Trapillion ones, which, are, which were white eggs, or brown eggs pr primarily, because mm -hmm. most chickens were brown, and um, they dyed them Brown, darker browns mm -hmm. and blacks, because those were the organic colors that were available at the time. And all the eggs that were made in the beginning were all done with organic materials. Okay. So um, the first, the early kiskas were just a piece of willow stick. They took a piece of copper, they wrapped the metal around a fine pointed nail so that the wax goes in and the big opening comes out to the pointed area and then they tied it together with copper wire because copper retains heat. And this is how we make our designs. We don't, as a rule, use pencil or whatever as mm -hmm. a cheating principle. I teach what I make what my students do. But you start off by heating the kiska over the candle. You put beeswax in the back because mm -hmm. bees wax has a high melting ability and it covers anything that you write with the wax and it comes out with this point so you'll see these fine lines this is all going to be white underneath the wax and then we dip it into the next darkest color which would be yellow preferably I like yellow and everything that I want to stay yellow I have to cover with beeswax then I go into the next darkest color which would be red and here I've already started coloring the points with red. And in the end, when we get finished, we have an egg that kind of looks pretty ugly. Mm -hmm. um, but this is my favorite time, when you unveil your jewel. And you'll put it over a candle, and as it melts, you'll see the wax melting, and then you just take the wax off, and then you have your beautiful jewel. So that's how we do a Ukrainian Easter egg. The more detail, the longer it takes. We just don't make them for decoration. We, we believe that having Pissenkin or home protects it against fire and lightning. Hmm. Um, we do make another type of egg bes besides the Pissenka, and we call it the Krasenka. The Krasenka comes from the word color, which is a hard-boiled egg. It's dyed one brilliant color, and it's eaten. Now, most people have made those, mm -hmm. but the pisanka comes from the word pisata, which means to write. It's a raw egg, it's never eaten, and it's dyed many brilliant colors. And that's what I've brought here today. And I've shared with you that I remember taking a class, and I'm 99% sure it was with you, when my daughter was quite young, probably through Girl Scouts. And I did many troops. And... <laughs> I still have the utensils at home, and I got very involved in it, got a book on it, and I really admire all of the design work here because I personally have a great appreciation for what it takes. And it is exciting to see the pattern emerging and learning how to think about the layers. It's a boutique principle. Mm -hmm. So you start, as I mentioned, how you go through all this. Now, one of the things that people don't realize it is that each design has a meaning. Before we accepted Christianity in 988, um, they had pagan meanings. But once we accepted Christianity, we have um, patterns like the reindeer. The reindeer represents health, wealth, and prosperity. Everybody wants him. Mm -hmm. um, if you want just health and wealth, you will have a ram on there or the ram's horns. Then you have um, this here is the pussy willow. Because Ukrainians didn't have palms in Ukraine, we had pussy willows in, in, 
instead. Mm -hmm. um, then you have um, zigzags. Zigzags represent protection. There's just so many different meanings, but like the star, which is the one that I have here, the star represents love and caring. So when you give this to uh, somebody, you're, you're giving them love and caring feelings. Mm -hmm. We have so many different patterns, and I could go on for a long time talking about them. Well, um, please share with the um, clock covering we have here on the table. You were telling me about the earth tones there, right. and that that's from a certain region? Right. It's not so much a region. Okay. It's the period, the Neolithic okay. period, um, when I was talking about the first designs, mm -hmm. um, that we, the colors of the eggs. This is the colors that we had, um, earthen tones. These are... The, I, right now, I only have cross stitch with me today, mm -hmm. but we Ukrainians, because we had kings and queens that married into the royal houses of Europe, they brought a lot of the European needlework with mm -hmm. them because what did women do? They would, they were doing needlework. So um, we have t like twelve different pa different types of embroidery. These are just cross stitch, but then we have yavuri, which is um, on done from the reverse side. Then you have Nazenka. I mean, there's just so many different mm -hmm. designs and patterns. And it's exciting when you see, like the Ukrainian National Women's League, they have a booklet that comes out once a month. And uh, there's always a pat new pattern oh, to people neat. to embroider if they, felt ha if they have the time. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and it's really um, so embedded in history. I mean, an understanding of how things evolved over time and historic influences, such as people, you know, royalty coming from other countries, and how those things would then influence some of the design work. I noticed some of your eggs had uh, images of um, religious buildings. Churches. Churches. Talk about um, how intricate some of these are, the little tiny um, threads of dots and cross and wow it's um and amazing it's, that someone that you were able did you do all of these some are my mother's oh wonderful my mother was the my mother taught me when i was six mm -hmm. and she has been she's the master okay she she just whips them out she whipped them out mm -hmm. my mother passed away about 15 years ago but she would whip out these eggs and she was just phenomenal mm -hmm. um and she also was a teacher she was probably the first to expose the Pisanka to the public because it was always a private art, oh. only taught between mother and fam and daughter usually. Mm -hmm. It was carried on that way. So my mother actually was criticized a little for sh showing for opening this, it up, opening it up to the public, but mm -hmm. that was back in the 50s. Okay. So, um, you know, but when you mentioned the dots, mm -hmm. the dots represent stars. Okay. Um, or they could, uh, or if they were in a cluster, if, if they're alone, they're the Blessed Virgin Mother's tears. All right. So, you know, we have all these different right. meanings. The symbolism. Yeah. And as I remember, you were saying your mom was um, a seamstress. Yes. So all that design ability translated over to I'm sure. I'm sure. She this was, art form. Yeah. She's yeah. very talented. And I assume she learned from her mother. In terms of the supplies, I know there's some dyes there, right? Do you want to just explain yes, how that works? Yes, because in order to... to get color on your eggs, mm -hmm. you use dyes. These are aniline dyes. The reason why we don't use food coloring dyes is because you can't cancel preceding colors without ruining the dye. These dyes will cancel at least a dozen eggs or more without changing the color. Okay. So, you know, the red would change eventually after putting all the yellow in mm -hmm. there and then darker colors too. So that's why we use these type of dyes. Of course, the Kiska, um, and then the beeswax. These are the few things you need to make yes. a business guide. It's very inexpensive art. And I can picture how people who didn't have a lot of means, right, could do this around Easter. I imagine it, it was the big time, Lent right? Again. Okay. And, and then in Ukraine, because it was winter, mm -hmm. they weren't out in the fields, so they had more time to work on the pisan kit. Mm -hmm. And you didn't unveil them officially. You didn't unveil them until Easter Sunday, when you brought all your food to be blessed mm -hmm. for Easter, the first Easter meal. And inside that basket were krasanka eggs, the hard boiled ones, and you always had your favorite pisanka in there. It's first ones. And then that's when you would you would greet everybody with the saying, Christos was kres, Christ is risen. And the reply would be, Vo Easter nu was kres, he has indeed risen. And that's Easter. 
And are you um, fluent in Ukrainian? I'm pretty good at it. I'm, I'm second generation, so I didn't have the, I didn't grow up in a Ukrainian community. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Newtown and was family was the only Ukrainians. Um, but I think I've improved since I've been involved in all these Ukrainian women's groups and they speak primarily Ukrainian. I understand it very well, Good. but um, sometimes you know, the higher higher forms, go, yeah. Uh, yeah, higher, higher forms of Ukrainian, mm -hmm. a little beyond me because I didn't go to college in Ukraine. <laughs> okay. And you present a lot of workshops. We talked a little bit about the Girl Scouts. So many, many community groups. Yes. Um, I have junior women. Okay. 45 years. That's when I got my first experience um, to teach, to, to lecture. Mm -hmm. I had never done it before. I was so nervous. But Barbara Sanders, who was International Affairs Chairman at the time, said, Gloria, we need a program. Can you do one for us? Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, okay, Barbara. You know, I was very hesitant about it, but I did it. And um, ever since then, I been going on from there. Television, um, schools, I love to teach, to show the art in schools mm -hmm. uh, and um, groups. Uh, I think I've done a workshop for junior women for about 45 years. Okay. Um, there's always a social, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's so exciting to me to see how the students complete. They start off, some are very good, some are you know, just learning. When they get to that final stage, the, the pleasure in their eyes when they look at that jewel that they created, mm -hmm. even if it has, doesn't look anything like a real piss and kit, right. they are happy. Mm -hmm. They are pleased with themselves, and that makes me even happier. And I think what's even more exciting to me now, um, with all the new immigrants coming, with the restriction the communists placed on the Ukrainians, that they were not to learn they were not to continue their heritage. Well, their traditions. Their traditions. Mm. Um, the villages did, but the mm -hmm. cities really weren't able to. And I have had people come to me at workshops at Ukrainian um, events, and they'll say to me, look at Pani Parbata. Look, this is my first Pisanka that I ever made. They're in their 30s. Mm -hmm. They're 40s. Mm -hmm. And this is their first. But their children are also making it with Mama. I mean, it was, it's just such a pleasure to know that here I am, born here, and I'm teaching them, and, it, and, and I'm proud that they're continuing the heritage. And we were discussing some of your work um, with the Ukrainians Women's League, right? It's an international group. Do you yes, want to talk a little bit about how they're working with folks in Ukraine? Yes. The women's group um, is a phenomenal group. They're, I think, 80-some years old now. What they do, they help. They always helped Ukraine. One of the things they did earlier when we had the Ukrainian Holodomor, which currently is an anniversary, this is I think our 76th year, when Stalin took the food away from the Ukrainians between 1932 and 33, um, people starved. We lost up to 10 million Ukrainians, mm. children, adults. I mean, it was devastating. You, the Ukrainian Women's League did what they could to publicized this out to the public, to mm -hmm. the government. They contacted all their senators and to let them know what was happening in Ukraine. Because at the time, um, nobody was talking about it because the only reporter that had good graces with Stalin was afraid to lose those graces, and he was from England, and he would not report mm -hmm. what was happening. So the people that came eventually to start looking over, what was this, is this really happening? Well, what they would do is they'd bring the train with all the grain, into the, to the area where they were mm -hmm. visiting, but as soon as those people left to go to the next area, so did the train. Mm -hmm. And these people were starving. I mean, they, the mothers were using birds. The mothers took leaves from the trees and boiled them to make some kind of something for their children. Mm -hmm. It was an extremely difficult period for Ukrainians, but it, it was mostly on the eastern part of Ukraine. And so you're very involved with the group in Stanford that you helped Oh, a I chapter, I right? Started, yes, but I was regional president of the Ukrainian mm -hmm. National Women's League, um, New England chapter. We started a branch in Stanford. Mm -hmm. It was my goal when I took over that we could, we should have a branch there because there's so many new women there uh, from Ukraine, the young women um, active in your Ukrainian circle, mm -hmm. and I thought this would be a great way for them to s get together mm -hmm. um, and work together towards Ukrainian goals. 
And um, they are a wonderful chapter. Um, they involve their children, their husbands. It's, they're just a delight to see. They're very active. And some of the things are um, engaged in helping aid people, uh, the soldiers in Ukraine, right? Yes, You're saying link, when they yes. go into the hospitals, they even have to bring their own linens. Yeah. So and People don't believe what, mm -hmm. what people in other countries have to go through. Mm -hmm. um, there's no such thing as insurance. Um, when a soldier gets injured um, and he has to go to a hospital, he has to bring his own pillows, his own p linens. Um, so what our group does, we have a doctor who travel, who works in the, in the hospitals, and we donate at least $1,000 per soldier mm -hmm. to help them get started. I mean, it, it may just help them at home with mm -hmm. their children uh, to put food on the table, but it's something that we can do, and, and so we're always looking for donations. Okay. We, we do a lot. I mean, even like when I do the piss and kill, you mm -hmm. know, we'll ask for a few dollars, and that money goes into our chapter, Wonderful. and we use it to help them help others. Yeah. And you also are very involved with a group in New Haven, St. Michael's Ukrainian Heritage Center? Yes, that's that's been around since our church celebrated its 75th anniversary. It's now 30, 40 years ago that mm -hmm. we've had this um, center. And it was started by May, Mary Hesse. Um, and she, because it was our 75th anniversary, she thought it would be great to have something where we could ex show our Ukrainian mm -hmm. culture. So they started it, um, I think, the, f the f greatest part is the photo history of our Ukrainians in New Haven, but also other pictures from when families came here, mm -hmm. some from the home. But it's a history of our parish and the New Haven Ukrainian community. There's a whole room with just photos. Then we have a room on the second floor that is mannequins of mm -hmm. different regions of Ukrainians' costumes. Nice. And it is just beautiful. Um, another room is with all piss and kit. Mm -hmm. Another room is with other art craft forms. We do ceramics, wood, um, leather. I mean, there's so many different types of artwork that, mm -hmm. we, that our people create, um, particularly the, the Hutzel people from the Carpathian Mountain area, because what do they do in the winter? Mm -hmm. You know, their sheep are pretty, pretty controlled right and uh, so they have time to work on these kind of things and their woodwork is so beautiful I mean this is an example um, it's not it's showing how they inlaid the wood different kinds of wood jewels wire mm -hmm. um, this is um, one type of Ukrainian art and how do you keep the younger generation engaged we have a Ukrainian school at our church okay uh, this year we incorporated a new program um, Ukrainian is a second language mm -hmm. for the children who are now second, third, and fourth generations. Um, we also have Ukrainian to Ukrainian for those that are new, that speak Ukrainian, but don't read and write it. Mm -hmm. um, those are, and we even have a nursery school now, and only on Saturdays, mm -hmm. but it's it's where the children learn songs and sing. You know, in fact, right now we're preparing for our St. Michael's Day dinner, and the children are learning poems and songs to to uh, perform. Um, then we have Ukrainian scouts, um, Ukrainian dancing. Mm -hmm. Ukrainians keep themselves busy. And then, of course, in September, we have this large Ukrainian festival in Stanford. It's called the Connecticut State Ukrainian Day Festival. My husband has been on the committee for 52 years wow. <laughs> since it started. We had our fifth, well, actually 53 this year. Mm -hmm. he, we've had 52 festivals. Um, currently, we're now at St. Basil Seminary in Stanford. Um, I've been on the committee since I got involved with my husband, so it's 50 years. Um, and I'm the vendor chairman and corresponding secretary and whatever else they need. Wonderful. Um, we're all, we, we just all help out. Mm -hmm. and, but that is the largest um, Ukrainian festival on the East Coast, um, in the, um, primarily above New York. It's Wonderful. in all New England, and we also have, have vendors that come from Maryland. We have visitors mm -hmm. that come from Philadelphia and, and, Pennsylvania, and Pittsburgh, yeah. Ohio. Mm -hmm. I mean, people come because it's a it's, destination it's, point. It's, yes. It is, and it's, we have a great program of Ukrainian songs and dance. Mm -hmm. And um, then in the evening, we have a, what we call a zababa, which is a dance, um, dance, you know, mm -hmm. dancing. At night. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so it's a lot of fun. Yes. And you're involved in uh, many, many things. Just a couple to mention. I know um, the Southern Ethnic Heritage Center. Yes. 
has different nationalities, right? That right. Are it's the Ethnic Heritage Center is composed of historical societies from the Afro-Americans, the Irish, the Italians, the Jewish, and of course the Ukrainians. Ukrainians. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, they're right. We're doing a program with students um, on immigration tomorrow. Um, we're working with journalism students mm -hmm. on Walk New Haven, which is a program that we've been we instituted a few years ago where we um, take bring in photos and do a little history. So if you're in New Haven and you want to walk New Haven, mm -hmm. you can you'll learn what all these historical buildings nice. represent, what they were mm -hmm. or were they're no longer there, but mm -hmm. you know it's part of New Haven history. Wonderful, and so it's, that's through Southern Connecticut State University. It's through the Ethnic Heritage. The Ethnic Heritage, and yeah. it happens to be we holding happen it to at be on Southern. Campus at Southern, which you said they've been great, right? In they've terms been of wonderful to us for almost thirty years. We've the been venue there. We've mentioned the Wallingford Community Women, and they've had their sixtieth right um, anniversary, We're sixty over 60. something, We're and over you've been 60, forty five years. Now. And I've been a member for 45 and years. And you are the oldest, longest-standing member, right? Yeah, I'm still alive. Juniors has given me probably more than I've given it. <laughs> okay, very, very good. So I'm trying I, to cover your community uh, activities I, I love there. that group. That group, for me, was one, several things. One, it, it introduced me to people in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I joined it when my I was... I had my son. Um, he was an infant when I went for my first um, membership social. Mm -hmm. um, but it gave me experience to run meetings, mm -hmm. um, to work on projects, to work with other people. Because I never had leadership training. Mm -hmm. And that's what juniors did for me. Um, they gave me the, the opportunity to speak in front of people where before I most shunned, people, I most shunned people. The, the spotlight, yeah, like, keep right. me in the back. Mm -hmm. um, and then they gave me the opportunity to be president um, in 1981, 82. And then um, that was an experience. <laughs> it was The group was large. When I joined back then, it was 125 members. Okay. Now with so many women working, mm -hmm. we have grown to 50. We're 50 wonderful. members now, yeah. strong. Yeah. They've done some wonderful projects. Mm -hmm. I love the Wallingford Dash, which is going to come up in April. Okay. And we do so much for the community. I mm -hmm. mean, we're always raising money to give to back to their community. Your background includes an associate's in accounting and a bachelor's in marketing, and you've used both of those through all of your adventures, and I know you had many jobs in the past. Mm -hmm one dealing with public relations at Wallace's. You were kind of the Betty Crockett of silver <laughs> where fictitious name people would write in with problems or questions with all things silver. Yep. That's very cool. It just seems to me such a wonderful thing. You have this heritage, uh, steeped heritage, you know, inherited from your mom and so forth with and your father. artwork and your father. That's right, he was Ukrainian too. <laughs> okay, and um, then you get the education to help some of that skill building, and then you, the Wallingford, you know, the women's group helping you to build the leadership skills and speaking, and now you're just out there everywhere <laughs> sharing, you know, uh, the art, the heritage, and, and helping in so many ways. But my favorite is, what, is my grandchildren. Okay. I have um, two children, and my daughter has two children who mm -hmm. are seven and nine. I've been watching them, helping her while she's been working two jobs, and... They're, they're a delight. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're also frustrating at times, you know, as go, all grandparents will tell you. Yes, but yes. But they're involved. They go to Ukrainian school on Saturdays. They're going to Ukrainian scouts tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're involved in Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. But um, they're, that's what grandmothers that's do. That's your joy. That's my joy. That's your joy. And so what advice would you give your younger selves? Like 25, 40, whatever ages seem to pop up. Well, I'm glad I didn't just sit home and do nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that I did get involved in my own local community because my husband joined the JCs, I joined the junior women, and we became we we made many friends mm -hmm. that I'm still close with. Um, those are people when you work with people, particularly in communities events, you really become close to them. Mm -hmm. They're they're like brother and sister to you after yeah. a while. Um, that would probably, I would still probably say to myself, keep being involved um, mm -hmm. because that is something that has been 
great for me. I don't know how to relax. Mm -hmm. Someone said, go on a cruise for our 50th wedding anniversary, and I said, I don't know how to relax. I'm so used to go, go, go. Well, maybe you're one of those people that I've heard the term active relaxers. You get um, satisfaction from doing. I do. It's true. Of course, yeah. striking a balance and conflicting priorities and schedules and all that, of course, at times, I'm yeah. sure, feels can be a little um, I think challenging. Is one of my challenges. It just seems like you've been such a giving person and um, such a valuable service, particularly with your heritage. I mean, think about it. Your mom came under some criticism for even letting people know about this wonderful f art form, and you're out actually promoting it, helped with your marketing degree, and um, teaching it. Yeah. And so that's, that's a wonderful legacy story I, to me. I was supposed to be a teacher. Okay. What were you going to teach? Business. Okay. I was going to teach business. I was really excited about it, but mm -hmm. then I wanted to get married, and my mother had this thing. You can't get married until you finish college. Okay. Yay, Mom. <laughs> she, and, yes, you're right. She, yeah. It was a good thing she pushed along. I uh -huh. was the first in her family to go to college, and um, so she really was determined that I would uh, finish college. But went to finish college, um, had a baby, mm -hmm. well actually bought a house in between, then had the baby. I delivered the baby six days after I got my diploma. Okay, but I finished Mom college. was happy, Mommy absolutely. Was happy. Yep. <laughs> and do you have a favorite quote or saying? I think one that my mother said, I, might not, I may not have been born in Ukraine, but I have a big Ukrainian heart. I love that. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful, and uh, I wish you all continued to success and don't stop, okay? Well, thank you for having Absolutely. me. Absolutely. And please do tune in to hear other fascinating women on future segments of Midlife Matters. I'm George Ann Lucier, your host, and thank you for joining us.